Tithing is an act of worship. It's a subject that needs to be addressed because our, why? Our world has a lot of, a lot of serious problems, a lot of serious issues, and humanity seeks to solve these problems through better technology. You know, if we can just come up with better stuff, then everybody's going to be happy and everything's going to go well. For some folks, the solution is a better distribution of material goods. If we can find out a way to, you know, share more equitably everything that we've got, I think that another way that we hope to solve our problems is with a heavy, heavy dose of wishful thinking. Heavy dose of wishful thinking. But the real answers, the real answers to humanity's quest for meaning and joyful living are spiritual not material. And those answers are available. They are out there. And they are within the message of the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. The creator of you, all people, makes that knowledge available in a written document, which I believe you probably all have in your lap or in front of you, his holy scriptures. Now, understanding of what that document is actually there to teach us is darkened, confused, to many people seemingly contradictory, and therefore seemingly discredited. And God has allowed it to be so. It's a separate message for a separate day, which we do address from time to time. But for our, today's purpose... In this darkened environment, God has provided a beacon of light, of right teaching, of true doctrine, and spiritual understanding that will cut through that fog. That beacon of light in this darkened world is the church. Not a nation, not an organization either. A spiritual organism that draws from all humanity, all peoples of the earth. It's a body of people that are commissioned as servants of Jesus Christ to take the message of the kingdom and of Christ to the world. Turn to Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. More red letters. Then <clears throat> Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you, always to the very end of the age. It's God's will and his purpose to work through humans as partners. God doesn't appear in the sky as a big glowing eye or write messages to us in the clouds. God's purpose is to work through humans, with humans, through humans. Now, at one time in the history of God's interaction with, with humanity, he worked through um, a physical entity, let's call it that, a nation, Israel. There was a time for that, and it began, and it ended. It's no longer in place. And at present, God is working through a spiritual entity, a spiritual entity, which is the church, the church of God. It's a spiritual entity, but it's operating in a very material world. A very, very material world. And so there are certain things that need to be taken care of, if you will. God provides for this very spiritual work in this very material world through tithing. That's just how it's been set up. And when you tithe, you not only 
honor God with your possessions, you partner with him in accomplishing his spiritual goals for this world. So there's a lot going on with tithing. Not only is it, you know, as I mentioned, an act of worship where you have this thing going on between you and God, you honor him, but you're also, or he's allowing you to partner together with him in the work that he's doing. Trying to draw you in, if you will. You know, if you have a, a child and you want to get them fired up about a project, well, you know, you give them a little bit of the job to do. You know, if you've got a little, a little person in the house and you're trying to teach them about taking care of household stuff, you might get them a little screwdriver and you know, help let them do a few of the little jobs around the house and things like that. A tithe. Well, a tithe, it's kind of an old-fashioned word. It's basically 10%. A tithe means the tenth part, and we'll see it is the tenth part of your increase or gain or net profit or whatever. Turn to Leviticus 27, if you would. Leviticus 27. I'm just going to kind of go through a couple of scriptures on this to see, nail it down. That Yep, it's 10%. Leviticus 27, verse 30 through 33. Here's speaking of a, a, it's kind of a tangent, but he's speaking of redeeming certain things that are devoted to God. In verse 30, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. And it is holy to the Lord. And then, in keeping with the overall chapter, he talks about redemption. Whoever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth of the value to it. Every tithe of the herd and flock, and this is where he says every tenth animal. So we get this, you know, it's the tenth part, and very clearly 10%, okay? So you don't have to do a big word study, although it's there. Tithe means, you know, a tenth part, but it says every tenth animal. The concept there, 10%. So every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. And then he goes on with some other issues about redemption. Now, Deuteronomy 14, if you would. Deuteronomy 14, verse 22. Very short, it says, Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. And this would apply, as we read in the previous scripture, to animals and other things. Your gain. The idea that comes out in this verse is what your fields produce. So it is an... In uh, it is a tithe on your increase. All right? God doesn't come and take 10% of all your assets every year because then you'd eventually left, be left with nothing. A 10% of your gain, your profit, what you've produced in that given year. Right? Now the reality is we looked at the scripture. The reality there is that everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to him. All of it. And... Uh, you know, there's verses in this scripture which are very poetic, and, you know, they, every animal on every hill belongs to the Lord. And we read it right there in that scripture in Leviticus. All this belongs to God. God just lets you use it for a while. You really kind of like have a lifelong lease on stuff that you own. And if you think about it soberly, you have to realize, and I'm sure that you do, when you're gone, it just passes to another. I might have a gold ring. Well, that gold, I don't know, it might have been mined out of the ground. It might have been melted down from someone else's jewelry who's passed and gone. And I'll have it for a while, and then it's gone. It won't be mine anymore. All these things belong to God. We kind of have them on loan. Uh, Deuteronomy, we're in Deuteronomy. Turn to chapter 8, if you would. Chapter 8, let's look at concept that uh, we want to kind of hold in our minds when we think of our stuff. Deuteronomy 8, verses 17 and 18. Chapter of warning. Chapter, verse 17 says, You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands has produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for he, for it is he. Where am I? Okay. 
kind of lost my smith. For it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. If we think that all this stuff that we've got, whatever you have at, at home or whatever you have counted up and you know you like to count your money and all that, um, you're wrong if you think that it belongs just to you. It is a gift to you, given to you to use. And God has some expectations about how you use it as well. We'll get into that a little bit more. Um, we're not going to really go off on stewardship today. We're just going to go through the basics on tithing. Deuteronomy 28, if you would. This is drawn out of the section on uh, the blessings and cursings. You know, if you keep my commands, if you keep this covenant with me, here's the good stuff that will happen. If you don't, things are not going to go well for you. And in verse 47 of chapter 28, one of... The reason I thought, you know, this is a good verse is because it shows what God is expecting. And he says, and this is part of the cursings, he says, Because you did not serve the Lord your God joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity, therefore in hunger and thirst and nakedness and dire poverty you will serve the enemies of the Lord. So these are the, these are the curses, the things that happen to people if they don't keep the covenant. But baked into that, we see God's expectation that we serve him joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity. And we are to serve him willingly. And you'll see that concept um, a little more later. We serve him willingly, joyfully, gladly with our stuff. With our stuff, which includes showing honor towards him with our stuff, with our material goods, by giving 10% back to him out of what was really his in the first place. And so it's a lesson, like you give your child an allowance, and but then you want them to pay for their own bubble gum, right? Well, it's your money, right? But you're teaching them a concept. And God is teaching you a concept. We are his children. Tithing is a form of worship. It is an act of worship. I... Um, People have different ideas about what worship is, and for some people it's very emotional, and I think that's you know, definitely part of the picture. Um, worship is also what you do. Worship is what you, what you think. It's how you feel, how you think, what you do. As far as tithing is concerned, that falls into the category of stuff you do. And it is something you do as a form of worship toward God, of showing honor toward God. It's also a form of worship that um, extends outside the boundaries of the covenant that God made with Israel, the Sinai covenant, the old covenant, however you want to, you want to name it. Abraham. Abraham tithed. Hundreds of years before that covenant was put in place, before God appeared on Mount Sinai, told the people of the commandments before the covenant was ratified, when they, Moses sprinkled blood on the people as they passed by, before any of that, Abraham tithed. Abraham gave 10% of what he gained, and he gave it to who? He gave it to the high priest of God, which at that time was Melchizedek. Okay? Abraham honored God with his material goods, and he gave thanks for the blessings from God, which in, in the case that we'll look at was the blessings of, of victory, where he went out to save Lot and a bunch of other people from being captured. Let's go to that in Genesis 14, if you would. Genesis 14, verses 18 and 20. So a bunch of uh, Abraham's kinsmen, basically Lot, were captured. Abraham rallies up his, his own household and they go and they rescue them <clears throat> in an act of war against these kings in the area. And let's see, verses 18 through 20, after this is all taken place, there's a bunch of spoil and good stuff that's left over after the battle. 
And after Abraham returned from, this is verse 17, from defeating Ketelamer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheveth, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. So Abraham honored God with his material goods and gave thanks for the blessing that he had received from God. Tithing is an act or form of worship. We're in Genesis. Go to chapter 28. Chapter 28. This is a section of scripture in Genesis where God reaffirms the covenant with Jacob, who was Abraham's grandson. And there might have been some good reason for that. I mean, Jacob got into all kinds of trouble, and he was basically being exiled from his home out of fear of his brother. And it could have looked like, well, you know, that covenant thing that Abraham had going on, uh, it's off the table now. It's really been messed up. But God reaffirms the covenant with Jacob. Let's take a look at verses 20 through 22. And well, How does Jacob respond to this? So God has said, hey, all this good stuff that I promised Abraham passes on to you, Jacob. And in verse 20, then Jacob made a vow, hearing this, saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking, running away from Esau, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So once again, we see the principle of tithing here. It's not built into the Sinai covenant, the laws that we see in Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. This is before that, hundreds of years before that. Jacob hears this great promise from God, and how does he respond? He's going to do some great stuff, some acts of worship. Uh, but he's also going to tithe. He says, I'll tithe. Because it is a form of worship. It is a form of worship. So God reaffirms the covenant with Abraham through Jacob, his grandson. And Jacob responds with a declaration of loyalty, his own personal loyalty, and a dedication to, of all things, tithing. I will worship you through tithing is what he's saying. Now, where did he put those tithes, or who did he give them to? I would assume it would be Melchizedek. It doesn't say so, but you know we're not that far removed from the time of Abraham. I would assume that it was going to Melchizedek, but we don't know. I suppose that means we don't really need to know. What we need to know is that the response to God's promise was an act of worship called tithing. So tithing is a part of the covenant of faith. If you think about all that is said in the New Testament about Abraham and faith and how he responded to God and his faith was counted as righteousness, well, think about the places that you find tithing. Tithing is part of the covenant of faith that began with Abraham and which remains today for the people of God. Tithing in the Sinai Covenant. Let's look at tithing in the deal that God had with the nation of Israel. Okay, let's take a look at that. As I mentioned earlier, God had established Israel among the nations in this, this land called Canaan. And his purpose for establishing this nation Israel was to perform his work in the world. Really the same work that we talked about at the very beginning of this message. That was God's purpose for Israel. They were to act as a living demonstration of his way of living among the nations, which they could admire and imitate. That was their purpose, to do the work of God on the planet. And this was, a, at the time, was the new method, something God was rolling out. And this new method of revealing himself to humanity through Israel also meant that there was going to be a change in administration. And specifically here, a change in administration of the priesthood. 
Instead of the order of Melchizedek, the tribe of Levi were set apart to do the priestly work, the work of God on earth. And then we'll see that the role of the high priest was delegated specifically to the family of Aaron. Numbers 18. Numbers 18, verse 21. I will give to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work that they do while serving at the tent of meeting. From now on, the Israelites must not go near the tent of meeting or they will bear the consequences of their sin and will die. It is the Levites who are to do the work at the tent of meeting and bear the responsibility for any offenses that are committed against it. This is, an ever, this is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. They, that's the Levites, will receive no inheritance among the Israelites. They're not going to get any land. This you know, great land of Canaan with all its crops and homes and good stuff. Instead... I give to the Levites as their inheritance the tithes that the Israelites present as an offering to the Lord. That is why I have said concerning them they will have no inheritance. The priests would not work the land. They would go into Canaan. People would get their farms. They would get their allotment and they would have the fields to produce the you know gain and all that. But the Levites, no. They wouldn't get any of this land Instead, what they got, their promise in the promised land, was the tithes. They would do the work of God. Now, the whole nation, as I mentioned, the whole nation was to do the work of God by being this living demonstration. The work of God that the Levites took care of was the temple service, okay, the sacrifices, and teaching the people the word of God. All right? Those were the roles of the priest. That's what they did. Now, if we continue reading on, there's an interesting little thing here. Uh, Numbers 18, verse 26 says, Speak to the Levites and say to them, When you receive from the Israelites the tithe they give you as your inheritance, you must present a tenth of that tithe as the Lord's offering. Your offering, offering will be reckoned to you as grain from the threshing floor or juice from the wine press. In this way, you also will present an offering to the Lord from all the tithes you receive from the Israelites. And from these tithes, you must give the Lord's portion to Aaron, the priest, or the high priest. And you must present as the Lord's portion the best and holiest part of everything given to you. So even the Levites had to learn the lessons of tithing. They tithe on the tithes that they received. Which is a good example of how tithing is not just about um, grain or apples or sheep. It is also about cash. Tithing, however, was badly, badly neglected in Israel. All right? Among many other things, they let down on their side of the, the uh, covenant bargain, if you will, and for that reason, they were allowed to be overcome in wars these horrible nations around them came and took over their land and took it away from them. And even Judah, the last remaining tribe, was exiled and expelled from the land for violating the terms of this national covenant. And we don't need to go into all the history of that, but they were condemned by God to spend 70 years of exile in Babylon and then Persia. Okay? And that's the story that you get when you read Daniel, for example. And a number of the prophets related around that time. Now once the 70 years were up, which God had prophesied, a remnant would be returned to the land and they would kind of reestablish it. All right? It would be a, like a faint shadow of what it formerly was. But a small group headed up by two key people, Ezra and Nehemiah, were sent back to reestablish the nation after this 70 years of exile. Neglecting God's commands, though, had become pretty much a way of living and a way of thinking uh, for these people. And it was going to take some hard work and some retraining, if you will, to get the people set back on the right path. And a lot of the responsibility for making this restoration happen would depend upon the priesthood. 
Now, if you go through the record that we have of that time, things did not go well when they came back. Things did not go well at all. And long story short, the people seemed to very quickly slip back into the same old habits of neglect that had caused their national defeat and exile. They just went back to their old habits, you know, not focusing on the things that God had asked them to do. And toward the end of the book named after him, Nehemiah puts his finger on the problem, on why this program of restoration was falling apart, why it wasn't working well. Let's go to that, Nehemiah 13. Imagine he had a lot to say about it, but he really nails it with this particular verse here in 13. Why is this stuff happening? Why is the program not working? It's God's program. It should work. There's no fatal flaw in it. Well, there is. The fatal flaw is always the people. <laughs> Nehemiah 13, verses 10 through 13. I, this is Nehemiah speaking, so he's saying, I, Nehemiah, also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service, of you the service in the temple, had gone back to the fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shemaiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Pediah in charge of the storerooms and made Hanan, son of Zakur, and son of Mataliah, their, their assistants, because they were considered trustworthy. They were responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. So as I said, uh, this is, to me, this is Nehemiah putting his finger on the problem, cutting right to the chase here. The priests were not doing their job. Right? Instead of doing the work of priests, where were they? Well, they were out in the field <laughs> with a plow and an ox, earning their living. Right? Everybody's got to eat. The priests weren't doing their job. The root of that is that the people were not funding the work of the priesthood with their tithes. And that is why the program was not moving forward. That was the issue. Instead of uh, properly managing the temple service, administering sacrifice, and teaching the people from God's word, the priests were out plowing in the field to earn their living. The need for steady funding for the work of God was not a surprise to Nehemiah. It's not like this just crept up on him and he thought, oh, 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 tithing, oh. No, he had thought of this in advance. Go to Nehemiah 10, verses 37 through 39. Here he's writing out an agreement with the people who are going to be part of this program. Okay, let's do this, this, that. Do you agree to do this? How about, and we kind of a contract, if you will. And in verse 37, moreover, we will bring to the storerooms, this is the agreement of the people, the storerooms of the house of our God to the priests, the first of our ground meal, of our grain offerings, of the fruit of all the trees, and of the new wine and olive oil. And we will bring a tithe of our crops to the Levites, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work. A priest descended from Aaron is to accompany the Levites when they receive the tithes, and the Levites are to bring a tenth of the tithes up to the house of our God to the storerooms of the treasury. The people of Israel, including all the Levites, are to bring their contributions of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the storerooms where the articles for the sanctuary and ministering priests are. The gatekeepers and musicians are also kept there. We will not neglect the house of our God. So he had it baked right into the whole plan from the very beginning. This is how we're going to fund this whole operation, folks. 
do you agree with this? And they said, oh, yep. Now, Nehemiah 12, verse 44, just another little detail there. Um, Nehemiah made preparation. At that time, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contributions, first fruits, and tithes. From the fields around the towns, they were to bring into the storerooms the proportions required by the law, etc., etc. He had prepared. Not only had he written it down into this contract, but he built warehouses for all this stuff to be stored. They had planned this. But it didn't happen. And that is why the whole program fell apart. And if you read through the, the prophets of that time, uh, Haggai, for example, uh, Malachi, which we'll look at, things were going badly. And that is why. Because there was no cash. <laughs> you might think that's awfully crass. And God could just, you know, through his awesome power, make all this stuff happen. Well, he does. But like I mentioned earlier, he actually allows you the opportunity to partner together with him and do the work that he has in, in mind on the planet. The same principles and expectations are at work today. All right, we've taken a look at old times and seen some principles. I have three I would draw out here. One, tithing is a form of personal worship. A personal worship where we honor God with our material wealth. Two, it is an acknowledgement and a form of thanks, if you will, to recognize and appreciate God's authority over and ownership of everything. Three, funding. Funding. God allows you the opportunity to partner with him in the work he is doing on earth. We saw what Nehemiah thought about it, where we read what Nehemiah, what his view about the importance of tithing was, and then we saw the bad results that were, were coming from that. Although we haven't really dug into the bad results, we can, but not right now, for neglecting the tithe. What's God's view? At this same time, as I mentioned, Malachi was a prophet in the land. So go to Malachi 3, and through the prophet, God gives you his take on what's going on. This is a prophecy that's going out to the people at the same time they're having this issue that Nehemiah is talking about. This is what Malachi says as a sort of the a spokesman, prophet of God. Nehemiah, or sorry, <laughs> Malachi 3, verses 7 through 12. Ever since the time of your ancestors, speaking here to Israel, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But then you ask, well, how are we to return? What are we doing wrong? What, what's missing? How, how shall we return to you, O God? What does he say? In tithes and offerings. In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. And then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. That's what God thought of the situation. Same situation. Nehemiah, the people, the priests out in the field, work in the field. Failure to tithe, failure to fund God's work in the world is a serious issue with God. He doesn't take it lightly. Um, okay, let's move, let's move forward and turn to Matthew 23. Okay, Matthew 23, just a short little dip into what Jesus taught on the matter. Uh, he didn't spend a lot of time on it. I think it was something that, it, that at the time that he was walking about in the flesh, it was pretty well understood because of all the painful lessons that they'd learned during the time of Nehemiah and so forth. In fact, they were kind of um, 
obsessed about little things like tithing, or little things like tithing on, you know, the, the herbs in their garden and stuff like that. Uh, in Matthew 23, Jesus talks to them about that. And he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, your cumin. You know, I, I, mean, I have, I have um, spices in my garden and um, stuff like that. And, you know, I, I, I think of these guys just, you know, parsing out the cumin seeds and giving 10% to the temple and feeling themselves very righteous. And I think, you know, Jesus is getting on them saying, what is with you people? You should, or say, but you have, in doing this, you have at the same time neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faith. Now, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You're required to do both, tithe and the weightier matters of the law. This is what Jesus taught people about tithing, Okay. He was kind of saying, look, don't think that you have fulfilled all your obligations by tithing. You still have an obligation for justice, mercy, faith, and so forth. But it doesn't mean that you don't tithe. Now, it's possible for people to argue, well, that was before Jesus died. And so when he died, then everything boom, is gone. And we start over with this clean slate, and we make up our own rules. Right? That's kind of, in a nutshell, what, what folks teach. So let's take a look at tithing in the New Covenant. Now, after, after Jesus' death, things did change when he died. All right? Big time. A lot of stuff changed. After Jesus' death and the establishment of New Covenant, there was once again a change in the administration of the work of God on earth. God would no longer perform his work through a physical nation, Israel. The New Covenant would be established with people from all nations, all people, all right? All nations, all backgrounds, who he, God, the Father, would draw to him, he would call them, and form out of them a spiritual nation, a subject worthy of its own sermon. We won't go there. But this spiritual nation, which I've referred to earlier the Israel of God. It's called the Israel of God in some places. It is the church of God. Let's go to Galatians 6, verse 16. Somewhat of an offhand sort of thing that Paul writes in the closing section of Galatians. He talks about the church and just says, oh yeah, the Israel of God. Uh, Galatians 6, verse 16. In his closing statement, he says, Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. I'm writing this to the Israel of God. The church in Galatia was part of the Israel of God. It was a change in the administration of how God's work on earth would be done. Uh, another good scripture on that, 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> Speaking here to the church, or writing to the church, Peter encapsulates this idea. But you, O church, if you will, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, you were not a nation, you were not descended from anybody important, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So how God was working in the world changed. The meaning of Israel, the reality of what Israel was, changed. With this new administration, with this change, uh, the institutions of sacrifice, priesthood, and temple were not done away with, believe it or not. They weren't done away with they were realigned and reapplied to a world and a reality forever changed by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We've been looking at Ephesians, and I don't know if we're up to that part yet here in Raleigh, but in Ephesians, Paul spoke of himself as a servant of God within this new administration. 
And I'll leave it to you to find that statement in Ephesians. But it's there. He says, I am a minister of God in, in this new administration. Okay? And in that same epistle, that same letter, he also confirmed that it was a new administration built on the foundation of the Old Testament writings. The law, the prophets, etc. Built on the same foundation, but a new administration. With Jesus Christ as its chief cornerstone. Just quickly, let's go to Romans 15. Which gives us a little bit of guidance on how we should look backwards at the old administration and the instructions for the old administration. Romans 5, verse 4, 15, sorry. Romans 15, verse 4 says that for everything that was written in the past, all this stuff, the majority of your Bible, all this stuff that was written back then, was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. That should be our attitude towards the Old Testament writings and instructions. But it does call for a little bit more explanation. And we actually have done this in quite a bit of detail. Uh, I think it was last year we went through the book of Hebrews together uh, in the Bible studies. And many of the changes in the administration of God's work in the world under the new covenant, many of the changes are explained in the book of Hebrews. The high priest, the administration of the high priest, it changes. The high priest is now the risen Jesus Christ. The office was not done away with. Ah, we don't need a high priest. No, it was changed. The administration of the high priesthood was changed. We still have a high priest. It is the risen Jesus Christ. And Hebrews also <laughs> tags along some commentary on it saying, and it's better. You'll see that in Hebrews all the time. It's better. This is an improvement, friends. So that's changed. And the change in the priesthood is discussed from a number of, of different angles. Um, sacrifice, the temple, worship. And then in chapter 7, you may as well go there, the change in the administration of tithing to the priesthood is addressed. All right? So let's see. What's important to get out of this is that you now tithe to Jesus Christ, the high priest of the new covenant. In Hebrews 7, <clears throat> verses 1 through 10, there's a recollection here of the uh, act of uh, Abraham and his act of tithing to the high priest at that time in that old administration, which was Melchizedek. Hebrews 7, verse 1. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. So we're talking about tithing. First, the name of Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling or like the Son of God. He remains a priest forever. Just think of how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of all the plunder. Now, the law requires the descendants of Levi, who become priests, to collect a tenth from the people that is, from their fellow Israelites, even though they also are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In this case, the tenth is collected by people who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tithe, paid the tenth through Abraham. Because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. His DNA was still in there, if you want to put it in scientific type terms. So Abraham, the father of the faithful, 
gave his tithes to Melchizedek, who was the one who later became Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. And Levi is lesser by comparison. And there was that change in administration where the tithes went to Levi. Right? And we'll see that it's changed again. All right, let's go on. Hebrews 7, verses 11 through 12. Now, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? I was talking of Jesus Christ here. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. Key verse, because what is it saying? It's not saying the law is done away, the law is eliminated, the law is annulled. It's saying it's changed. We're changing stuff here. And what's being changed is the law of the priesthood, the administration of the priesthood. And you will find that this is the overarching theme of the book of Hebrews. And we're just you know, diving in here and looking at it in relationship to tithing. So there's a change in the administration of the priesthood and therefore a change in the instruction about tithing. There must therefore be a change in the law, in the instructions. Tithes are still to be given to the priest of God, but the administration of the priesthood is forever changed. Remember, this is a law that exists outside the bounds of the covenant with Israel, the Sinai covenant. It's still in play. What's changed is where you direct it. All right, we're in Hebrews. Let's take a look at verse 15. Um, and what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, or sorry, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. Speaking of the risen Jesus Christ. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath, other priests became, sorry, and it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath, but he, speaking of Jesus, became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. And that kind of nails it that we're talking about Jesus Christ here. The change in administration of the priesthood is a change to Jesus Christ as the high priest. And therefore it affects all the laws and regulations related to the high priest. One of which would be tithing to the priesthood. Under the new covenant administration, you tithe to the living Jesus Christ. That's your responsibility. Who is your high priest? Now the living Jesus Christ is also the head of the spiritual organism that I described earlier which is his church. You can look at that in Ephesians 5. He is the head of the church. This is his thing. This is his deal. Okay? The work of God in the world is now performed through that church. Not Israel, not a nation, but through the church of God and through his word. As the head of the church, Jesus Christ has delegated to those who minister. Uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 through 14. There are other sections of scripture we could look at for the whole, you know, what we know about the, the church and its structure. This one is a good one. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 13 and 14. Paul writing about um, issues in Corinth and, of course, now Paul had his reasons for not operating under this paradigm and he did not receive funds at all times. And he did that 
and it's very interesting to go through why he did that. It's fascinating. Uh, basically, he was trying to set an example for people that they needed to work. <laughs> yeah, he, he wanted them to figure out they needed to work because they had a lot of social welfare programs in, in these places where he was preaching, and a lot of people didn't work. And he gets on their case about, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's why he said things like that because a lot of people were just, they were bums, and they were living off the fat, and he had issues. But he says this in... Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 and 14. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? Well, these tithes that are coming into the temple. And that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered at the altar? In the same way, God has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Well, let's go back to the, the premise that I put on the table earlier. Tithing is an act of worship. Through tithing, you honor God with your material goods. And it's a very personal thing. Like all worship, it, it is on many levels very, very personal. And it teaches you. I mean, looked at that just to recap. It teaches you an attitude of thankfulness and humility. And it also gives you an example of, of giving and providing. And then secondly, the very practical um, side effect is that it funds the work of God on earth and allows you the opportunity to partner together with him in the work that he is accomplishing. Now, as befits an act of worship, tithing is something that you do willingly. Okay? Tithing is something you do willingly. By that, I, I, I mean this. The church does not check up on you doesn't mean the church doesn't care. But the church does not check up on you and does not keep a record of who ties or how much. We just, it's like a black box, if you will. All right? Church does not check up on you or attempt to enforce tithing. We teach it, okay? That's what we're doing right now. We teach it because it is part of your worship of God, Okay? But the, the, the church is not in the role of um, enforcing anything, really, if you get down to it. Uh, we, we can't enforce the laws of thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal or commit adultery. We have no, no power in this world to enforce any of those things. In the New Covenant, the administration, um, the Church of God, the Assembly of God, doesn't have power to enforce or punish. We don't have any power to punish anybody. You go out, you break commandments, you break God's law. We, got, we have no teeth. Church can't do anything to you. Right? Nothing. Those, those prerogatives for what will be punished or what will be enforced, those are left to the nations and states and countries and dictators and kings and presidents and all those people. That's their deal. That's what's been given to them. And they, they do it however they see fit. God has given them that authority. They have that power. We do not. And we don't try to enforce it. We're foolish if we do. If you think about it seriously, friends, the worst thing that the church can do to you is to say, we don't want to hang around with you anymore. That's, that's, that's it. That's all we've got. We don't want to associate with you. That's, that's as stern as the church gets. <laughs> so you're on your own. All right? You really are on your own. And tithing is an act of worship, and it is very personal, and it's your act of worship. Okay? The church's role is to teach you. So is there a penalty for not tithing? Okay? Is there a penalty for not tithing? A well, good question. I, um, now, as I, I mentioned, the church does not enforce or punish, and uh, <clears throat> even if we tried... We, we could, what could we do? But disregarding God's instructions does have personal consequences. All right? Failure to tithe could have a lot of different negative consequences. Most of them will be in relation to your interaction with, with God himself. It probably, I think this is very probable, will diminish your potential for effective service to God. 
through godly stewardship of your wealth, which is something that he expects of you. Right and proper stewardship of the good things that he's given you. You're, you would be kind of saying, well, you know, I love you, God, and I'm willing to you know, say nice things about you and sing songs and wave my arms and stuff like that, but I don't want to help you perform the work that you're doing on earth. You know, I'm good with this, not with that. Okay? Neglect to tithe, and you will probably also miss out on the blessings that God promises, which we read in Malachi 3. That doesn't mean that anyone who doesn't tithe immediately becomes a pauper and ends up, you know, pushing a shopping cart under a bridge somewhere. No. But God promises you blessings. It's not for me or for the church to tell you what those blessings are going to be or how you should realize them or feel them or experience them. But that's God's promise to you. Third, one that we also read about in Malachi, we read God's opinion on the matter, and he says, because of what they were doing, they brought themselves under a curse. Now, I would, I would add to that, and I would say, for those who know that would happen, for someone who's oblivious, you know, someone who you know, was raised on some remote island in the Polynesian peninsulas, never read the word of God, and who doesn't tithe, well, I don't think God's going to just curse that person. But if you know better, if you know what's right, you know what's expected of you, you don't do it anyway. I think the word that we have from God is, you brought yourself under a curse, you people. So beware. That's between you and God, not me. Tithing is an act of faith. Right? It's an act of faith. We've looked at faith and that faith is not just a feeling, a warm glow in your heart. It's what you do. And tithing is one of those things. It's what you do. And it is an act of faith. Now, you might think, no, I don't have enough. I don't have enough for myself. And even, you know, whatever I had, I earned so little that whatever I were to tithe on would just be a drop in the bucket. Now, all I can say is encourage you to step out in faith. God has promised that he will bless those who act upon their faith. God does not evaluate based on how much you give, but on how faithfully you give. And I can guarantee you that your tithe is not a drop in the bucket. Do not ignore the opportunity and calling to partner with God in the work that he is performing on earth. Worship your creator, part of which is through tithing.